Good day and welcome to the Pure Storage Fiscal Fourth Quarter and Full Year 2024 Earnings Call. Today's conference is being recorded. All lines will be muted during the presentation portion of the call with an opportunity for question and answer at the end. If you'd like to ask a question, please press star and number one on your telephone keypad. At this time, I'd now like to turn the call over to Paul Zayitz, Vice President of Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Pure's fourth quarter and fiscal year 2024 earnings conference call. On the call, we have Charlie Giancarlo, Chief Executive Officer, Kevin Chrysler, Chief Financial Officer, and Rob Lee, Chief Technology Officer. Following Charlie's and Kevin's prepared remarks, we will take questions. Our press release was issued after close of market and is posted on our website where this call is being simultaneously webcast. The slides that accompany this webcast can be downloaded at investor.peerstorage.com. On this call today, we will make forward-looking statements which are subject to various risks and uncertainties. These include statements regarding our financial outlook and operations, our strategy, technology, and its advantages, our current and new product offerings, and competitive industry and economic trends. Any forward-looking statements that we make today are based on facts and assumptions as of today, and we undertake no obligation to update them. Our actual results may differ materially from the results forecasted, and reported results should not be considered as an indication of future performance. A discussion of some of the risks and uncertainties relating to our business is contained in our filings with the SEC, and we refer you to these public filings. During this call, all financial metrics and associated growth rates are non-GAAP measures other than revenue, remaining performance obligations, or RPO, and cash and investments. Reconciliations to the most directly comparable gap measures are provided in our earnings press release and slides. This call is being broadcast live on the Pure Storage Investor Relations website and is being recorded for playback purposes. An archive of the webcasts will be available on the IR website and is the property of Pure Storage. Our first quarter fiscal 2025 quiet period begins at the close of business Friday, April 19, 2024. With that, I'll turn it over to Charlie. Thank you, Paul. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Q4 and fiscal 2024 earnings call. We had a solid Q4 performance and ended the year with increasing sales momentum and balanced performance across our theaters and product portfolio. This momentum and growing customer interest in our platform strategy provides us with increased confidence for the coming year. This year, we expanded our Evergreen portfolio and increased subscription services revenue now to over 40% of total revenue. FY24 total contract value sales for Evergreen One and Evergreen Flex grew to over 400 million, more than doubling over the prior year. Product and platform innovation was strong as evidenced by Flashblade now exceeding $2 billion in total sales since launch. Flashblade continues to serve as the leading platform for customers' modern file and object data requirements for both high performance and low cost applications. Launched just nine months ago, our new e family of products achieved the fastest sales growth of any pure product, presaging that Flash will soon replace all disk. Our data storage platform strategy and vision is working and continues to succeed with large enterprises and managed service providers. Pure strategy to consolidate data storage using a single operating and management environment for the majority of storage requirements just makes more sense than managing multiple different and disparate system environments. Pure's direct flash reliability and economics continue to be unmatched, and customers appreciate our evergreen guarantee of no application downtime with system upgrades. Pure's platform strategy incorporating Pure Fusion, which enables Pure systems to operate as a distributed storage cloud, combines the best features of enterprise storage with cloud agility and programmability. It enables customers to manage their data environment as unified storage pools, seamlessly spanning across data centers and public cloud platforms, all within a single operating and management framework. 
Secure allows customers to organize their data infrastructure efficiently and optimize their data environment. Our platform vision was a major factor in several strategic enterprise deals in Q4. In one example, a major Fortune 500 financial services firm selected Pure based on our platform strategy, our proven reliability, and our ability to satisfy the majority of their diverse storage needs with a consistent environment and cloud-like operation and efficiency. This high eight-figure deal comprised almost all of Pure's products and services and represents our growing success in large enterprise. A second notable eight-figure deal this past quarter was an Evergreen One deal with one of the largest specialized GPU cloud providers for artificial intelligence, offering highly differentiated AI infrastructure solutions to their customers. Pure is excited to partner with this company to deliver one of the most powerful and fastest AI training environments in the world. However, what truly excites me about AI confirmed through conversations with customers and partners is the focus that it is bringing to customers' fragmented data environments. Customers are beginning to realize that their current fragmented data storage environment will significantly hinder their ability to leverage AI to unlock the full potential of their data. Current data storage environments inhibit AI deployments in two ways. First, existing data storage arrays were selected to provide just enough performance for their primary function, leaving little performance left for AI access. Second, existing storage arrays are not networked, limiting access to AI apps not provisioned directly on their primary compute stack. The Pure Storage Platform solves both of these issues. Pure's eFamily delivers flash reliability and efficiency at prices now comparable to traditional hard disk systems and with plenty of performance to spare for AI access. And the single operating and management environment of the Pure Platform across protocols and price performance ranges makes accessing data easier. We are also seeing increased numbers of Portworx deployments in AI environments for data management preparation. Portworx had a record year and accelerated growth based on customers increasingly graduating their container-based development projects to production scale. Portworx saw strong sales in the financial sector this past quarter. A leading global financial institution significantly improved the efficiency and lowered the cost of critical tier zero applications by automating its internal cloud infrastructure with Portworx. Portworx industry leadership was recognized by IDC, which positioned Portworx as an industry leader in their new and latest Kubernetes container data management category. As we reported all year, Evergreen One consistently experienced breakout growth. Customers appreciate the simplicity of Evergreen One's SaaS model. The Evergreen One service offers always improving data services, always modern infrastructure, and a world-class customer experience with contractually guaranteed service level agreements. Now with Evergreen One, Pure pays customers for power and rack space when hosting the service in their data centers. Adding to our SLA industry leadership, Pure introduced three new SLA guarantees this past year. One, no data migration. Two, zero data loss. And three, power and space efficiency across our Evergreen family, Evergreen Forever, Evergreen One, and Evergreen Flex offerings. Our commitment to offering the most sustainable storage solutions in the industry continues to drive competitive advantage for customers focused on their environmental reporting. Furthermore, the energy demands of the AI is outstripping the availability of power in many data center environments. Pure flash solutions can reduce data center power usage, space, and e-waste by approximately 20%. And this is proving critical in an environment driven by artificial intelligence and the world's growing demand for data. We are increasingly confident in our platform strategy and our opportunity to lead this market. Our evergreen technology and programs are changing the industry, 
allowing customers to eliminate the need to continually rebuy and disruptively replace outdated hardware. Most importantly to enterprises, Cure reduces risk, eliminating application downtime due to infrastructure updates and upgrades while dramatically improving system reliability. Our confidence is bolstered by our four sustainable competitive advantages. This includes our ability to deliver a single operating and management environment for the majority of enterprise data storage needs. Our evergreen technology, which guarantees an always modern environment without application disruption. Our direct to flash management, which enables both performance and cost leadership. And finally, our cloud operating model, which allows customers to manage all of their data across data centers and clouds as unified pools of data. While we remain cautious about the economy, we are beginning to see some encouraging signs of improvement in the macro environment. As the industry's most performant, consistent, and sustainable storage solution, we are well positioned to serve both the energy and data intensive demands of artificial intelligence. Additionally, after 18 months of steep declines, NAND market pricing is stabilized which should improve storage market growth. Looking forward to FY25, I have high confidence of returning to double digit revenue growth given our platform strategy, our growing product portfolio, our cloud operating model, and strong customer demand for our Evergreen and Portworks subscription offerings. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Kevin now. Thank you, Charlie. We are pleased with our Q4 financial performance, exceeding guidance for both revenue and operating profit. As we were expecting, customer demand for our consumption and subscription-based offerings was very strong, especially for Evergreen One, our storage as a service offering, and Portworks. Annual sales for both offerings grew over 100% in FY24 and total contract value or TCV sales for Evergreen One and Evergreen Flex exceeded $400 million. Remaining performance obligations or RPO associated solely with our subscription service offerings at the end of Q4 was very strong, growing 29%. Our subscription services net dollar retention or NDR at the end of the year was 120%. For the year, revenue grew 2.8%. As a reminder, our annual revenue growth expectations at the beginning of FY24 assumed that Evergreen One and Evergreen Flex TCV sales would grow approximately 50%. When adjusting for the substantial growth above our expectations at the beginning of the year for Evergreen One and Evergreen Flex TCV sales and a non-cancelable product sale with a telco customer we mentioned last quarter that is expected to be shipped in FY25, revenue growth for the year would have been over 7%. As a reminder, revenue from our Evergreen One and Evergreen Flex consumption and subscription service offerings are recognized over time. Whereas product revenue related to sales of our products across our data storage platform is recognized upon shipment. Operating margin for FY24 was approximately 16% above our original guide of 15% at the beginning of the year. Key contributors of our operating margin strength were strong gross margins across our data storage platform, reflecting the value of our solutions and disciplined investing. Total RPO which also includes product orders, grew 31% year over year in Q4, exceeding 2.3 billion. Product orders included in total RPO at the end of Q4, including a non-cancelable telco order that we mentioned last quarter, and orders relating to a significant win in Q4 with a major Fortune 500 financial services company. In Q4, Subscription services annual recurring revenue or ARR grew 25% to approximately 1.4 billion, highlighting the strong traction for our consumption and subscription-based service offerings. As we mentioned previously, subscription services ARR excludes non-cancelable evergreen subscription contracts, 
where the effective service date has not started. Including non-cancelable subscription contracts where the effective service date has not started, subscription services ARR at the end of Q4 grew 27%. Subscription services revenue during Q4 was $329 million, growing 24% and comprising 42% of total revenue. U.S. revenue for Q4 was $522 million, and international revenue was $268 million. Our new customer acquisition grew by 349 customers during Q4, including six new Fortune 500 customers. We now serve slightly over 60% of the Fortune 500. Product and subscription services gross margin both contributed to total gross margin strength of 73.7% in Q4 and 73.2% for the year. In Q4, product gross margin was 73.4% and subscription services gross margin was 74.1%. Our headcount increased slightly to nearly 5,600 employees at the end of the quarter. Pure's balance sheet and liquidity remains very strong, including approximately $1.5 billion in cash and investments at the end of Q4. Cash flow from operations during the quarter was approximately $244 million and approximately $678 million for FY24. Capital expenditures during the year were nearly $200 million, representing approximately 6.9% of revenue for FY24. Factors driving our higher capital expenditures during the year included sales growth of our Evergreen One storage as a service offering, our new headquarters, and test equipment supporting our engineering team for new product innovations. In Q4, we repurchased 585,000 shares of stock, returning approximately 21.4 million to our shareholders. For the year, we repurchased nearly 4.7 million shares, returning nearly 136 million in capital to our shareholders. Consistent with our remarks last quarter, our share repurchases represent a lower level of repurchase activity as a result of the fixed trading parameters that were in place throughout the quarter. We have approximately $145 million remaining on our existing $250 million repurchase authorization, and we are announcing today a new share repurchase authorization of an additional $250 million. Now turning to our guidance for FY25. We expect to return to double-digit revenue growth in FY25, growing 10.5% to $3.1 billion. We expect demand across our entire data storage platform will strengthen while also remaining cautious of the macro spending environment. Our annual revenue guide of 10.5% growth also contemplates approximately 50% growth in TCV sales for our collective Evergreen One and Evergreen Flex service offerings, which are expected to be 600 million. To help better understand the short-term impact the growth of our consumption and subscription offerings have on our annual revenue growth rate, we estimate that our forecasted FY25 revenue growth would be in the mid-teens when adjusting for the expected growth of both our Evergreen One and Evergreen Flex service offerings, slightly offset by expected additional revenue arising from past TCV sales in FY24. Consistent with our philosophy in driving profitable growth, we expect FY25 operating profit to be 532 million and operating margin to be 17%. Our expected operating margin for FY25 is in line with our longer term goal of expanding operating margin by a percentage point or two each year and represents a two point increase from our FY24 guide that we communicated at the beginning of the year. For Q1 of FY25, we expect revenue of $680 million, up 15.4% when compared to Q1 of last year, and expect that our operating profit will be $68 million, or operating margin of 10%. In closing, we are pleased with our expectations of getting back to double-digit revenue growth and continuing strong growth from our Evergreen One storage as a service 
and Evergreen Flex offerings. Pure's data storage platform and Evergreen architecture delivers substantial business value to our customers by reducing complexity while increasing reliability, flexibility, and unparalleled power and cost efficiencies. With that, I'll turn it back to Paul for Q&A. Thanks, Kevin. Before we begin the Q&A session, I'll ask you to please limit yourselves to one question consisting of one part so we can get to as many people as possible. If you have additional questions, we kindly ask that you please rejoin the queue and we'll be happy to take those additional questions if time allows. Operator, let's get started. Thank you. If you'd like to ask a question, please press star followed by number one on your telephone keypad. If for any reason you would like to remove that question, please press star followed by number two. Again, to ask a question, press star and number one. As a reminder, if you are using a speakerphone, please remember to pick up your handset before asking your question. We will pause briefly as questions are registered. The first question is from Amit Daryanani from Evercore. Your line is now open. Um, thanks a lot. Good afternoon, everyone, and congrats on a nice sprint here. Um, you know, I guess, Charlie, the question for you is, you know, it looks like Evergreen One sales should continue to grow at a really robust rate again into 20, fiscal 25 after what you saw in 24. Uh, can you just touch on, you know, what do you think is resonating so well from a value proposition basis with customers when it comes to Evergreen One offering? And then, you know, is there a framework to think about how much of your revenue base, kind of your, you know, your shipment base, if you may, could actually move to a subscription model over time? Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Amit. Hope you're doing well. So, actually, I, I think I could uh, answer the question in, in really two ways, the economic and then the non-economic. And I'll start with the non-economic first. What's very exciting about Evergreen One is that it really is a SaaS-like model. And I think just like uh, you and, and probably everybody else on this call no longer use external hard drives on their on their uh, you know PCs or laptops, but use some type of cloud-based service because of the ease. It's managed for you. You don't have to worry about it failing. You're able to easily um, you know just uh, uh, subscribe to more uh, capacity if that's what you need without worrying about having to go out and buy and configure a new system. The same is true uh, with our Evergreen One um, uh, service. That is, it really is storage as a service. Uh, you know, whether that is deployed in the cloud, uh, you know, in a colo or actually on the customer's premise. And now, you know, if it's deployed on the customer's premise, we pay them for, for hosting it for us. So, you know, from the customer standpoint, uh, it has all of the attributes of a SaaS service. They manage it entirely through the cloud. Uh, we manage it otherwise. Uh, we're constantly looking at it from a capacity and performance standpoint, upgraded as, as necessary. Uh, mostly remotely, uh, and uh, so it's a very easy service and completely managed. And of course, that's the way that the modern world is operating now, and the reason why many customers, I think, are attracted to the service. Of course, the economic elements of it are that they only pay for what they use when they use it. They don't need to buy a system that is sized at the rate that they think they'll need four or five years hence they're able to just pay for what they, as I said, what they use when they use it. So, you know, it's compelling from both economic and non-economic uh, uh, purposes. Uh, you know, lastly, um, you know, we're now at 42% in terms of total subscription. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think easily, uh, you know, with any continued uh, growth in this environment, we certainly see our way clear to a majority uh, of, rev of revenue over time being in the subscription category. Thank you, Amit. Next question, please. The next question is from the line of Aaron Rakers from Wells Fargo. Your line is now open. Yeah, thanks uh, for taking the question, um, and also congrats on the, on the quarter. Um, I wanted to actually ask about the numbers a little bit. The the RPO balance at two point three billion stands out, but I think even more notably. Uh, is the unbilled component of that at about 709 million? That's up about 93% year over year. I know, you know, Kevin, you talked about the 41 million uh, from the telco uh, sitting in that number uh, this last quarter, but you also alluded to a, it sounds like a very large, uh, significant win with a major financial services company. 
I think if we unpack that, 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 that might give us a little bit more insight into the subscription growth that you're seeing. So I'm, I'm wondering if you could help us bridge, you know, that growth in the unbilled RPO number, uh, X those big product contributions in the quarter. And just, just any help would be uh, useful. Thank you. Uh, th that's great, Aaron. How are you? Um, I will I will give you some of the bridging discussion, but before we get into it, yeah, we're really excited about this Fortune 500 win. Let me have Charlie explain that a little bit, and then I'll, I'll provide some bridging information for you. Yeah, the win came in a bit late in the quarter, so you know it's obvious that uh, you'll be deploying that um, through um, uh, through through this uh, new uh, fiscal year. Very exciting. Uh, they really uh, um, it was a deal that covered really the majority, if not if not most of of Pure's uh, services, our products. Uh, and frankly, it was all based on them buying into and fully understanding the ramifications of having a single operating environment uh, to unify their their data storage environment. So, really pleased with that win. And then, and then, Aaron, from a bridging standpoint, our, our total RPO, which would include product orders, and again, that's the telco order, and that's the significant win with the Fortune 500. And, and you're exactly right. Um, both of those would be unbilled because we haven't uh, shipped uh, the product yet. So as we ship that product, you'll see more billings come through, um, as, you know, as it relates to that RPO. But the other large piece of it is going to be uh, the significant growth of our Evergreen One and Evergreen Flex subscription offerings. And again, we, we bill for that either annually, uh, quarterly, depending on uh, what the customer's preferences are. So that will be a large piece of the unbilled that you're seeing as well. Thank you, Aaron. Next question, please. Our next question comes from the line of Mita Marshall from Morgan Stanley. Your line is now open. Great, thanks. Um, you know, maybe on the AI discussion, I think a lot of the the conversations we've been having with investors is just trying to figure out the timing of you know when you would expect some of these storage investments versus. You know, is that in the data preparedness time as you're getting ready for inference? Just any kind of patterns that you're seeing just in terms of, of timing when uh, enterprises or other customers are considering these investments. And then maybe just as a second question, you know, there's been a lot of talk about volatility and NAND pricing, you know, hammer on uh, from some of the disk vendors, uh, you know, is there even a conversation about okay, are we, you know, at a different crossover point this year, or has the conversation really moved on to, okay, I'm, I'm moving my infrastructure eventually to all flash, um, you know, let's not be concerned about a quarter-quarter uh, price differential. Thanks. Mita, this is Paul. I'm sorry I'm going to be the bad guy um, so that the others don't get upset with us. We'll take your first question, and then at the end, we'll pick back up on your last question. Hi, Mita. Sorry, I had to follow that. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so let's talk about uh, AI. And you're right. I, you know, I'm I'm sort of looking at the AI market in three categories. One is the modeling area. That's the super high performance, you know, GPUs, super high performance storage, everything to go along with it. The inference uh, market, which involves perhaps some GPUs, but but uh, and and good performance, but not necessarily you know the the uh, supercharged performance, and then just the data, uh, the the general data up or the uplift to data storage that needs to take place, so that customers can get access to data that's right now in silos. Um, obviously, the market has been transfixed uh, with the modeling side of things, uh, and I think appropriately so, but. But I do think out of all of them, it's probably um, you're probably the smallest in terms of total total market size. Um, and of course, the world is going gaga on that, and we're tracking a lot of different uh, um, entities and activities uh, on that. Uh, you know, in the modeling part of the market, I think inference is only just beginning. Customers trying to figure out uh, what they're going to do there. I think what's really impressed me over the last six months is I've spoken to both customers and 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 uh, large integrators and channels that that work with customers is everybody starting to recognize that their current data environment is not really up to the task of being able to even offer the data, let alone do it at high high performance uh, to the um, AI environments that they'll want to create. So that's uh, I view that as a, a very large opportunity. So I would say we're still very early in this. I think that's the other part of your question. I think we're very early in this, and I think it's going to take some time for it to uh, uh, to work its way through the enterprise 
uh, through enterprises uh, planning horizons. Yeah, and Mita, this is Rob, just to jump in on that. Uh, I would definitely agree, uh, echoing Charlie's comments, uh, you know, from my own discussions with customers, I, I think we're early in cycle in terms of uh, customers really uh, understanding uh, how do they transition in, uh, you know, from breaking down uh, you know, the silos that uh, you know, have, uh, are fragmenting their data today, moving away from uh, physical limitations to you know, being able to connect data uh, access through automation and policy, uh, certainly bringing performance uh, to all areas of their data. I think the other discussion that we're having is uh, customers that are navigating this uh, space are realizing the importance of future-proofing uh, their technology decisions, uh, especially as it uh, pertains to infrastructure uh, investments. Um, you know, if you're investing in building out infrastructure to uh, modernize and prepare uh, your environment for AI, uh, it's absolutely critical uh, that you're making choices that are going to be uh, of utmost flexibility uh, just because of the speed uh, that the space is moving in. And so when you kind of map that, you know, step back from that and, and map that down to, uh, you know, the pure portfolio, uh, you know, very pleased with our position, right? You, you know, you can see where, um, you know, our single uh, consistent software and hardware uh, operating environment with Fusion uh, really helping customers, uh, uh, you know, emerge from that fragmented uh, data storage uh, uh, position. Uh, certainly what we're doing with E uh, in terms of bringing performance, uh, much needed performance uh, to an area of storage that, frankly, uh, has uh, been lacking that for quite some time, uh, and then certainly with Evergreen, uh, bringing that uh, future-proofing uh, and optionality. Thank you, Mita. Next question, please. The, the next question comes from the line of Tim Long from Barclays. Your line is now open. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I wanted to, to follow back up on, on margins and, and leverage a little bit here, um, kind of as it it, it pertains to the company becoming a little bit more of a you know subscription service based. Um, so maybe kind of a two parter here. Just talk about you know the gross margin line. It does look like that's probably guided a little bit lower. It's been been a pretty high level. So kind of what are the levers on on the gross margin line? And then maybe Kevin, can you just talk a little bit about the kind of opex in, investment in an environment where more of the uh, revenues is going to be pulling off um, of the subscription line. Thank you. Tim, I'll jump in and be the bad guy again. Kevin, please go ahead and take the gross margin question, and we'll come back to the OPEX uh, later. Yeah, and I'll, I'll do that in the context of, of FY25, and we can we can go into some more detail if needed. But look, please, with both gross margin and, and operating margin performance, as we think about it in 24, and it really is consistent with our philosophy of, of driving profitable growth, and as we look to FY25, you know, we're again expecting to expand our operating margin to 17% uh, while also returning to double-digit revenue growth. And, and this assumes that our operating expenses will grow at a slightly lower rate than what we saw in, in FY24 uh, as we continue to invest in our sales capacity and, and in innovation. Uh, and, and you're right, Tim, this would then imply a slight decline in, in gross margins, which we expect to be derived uh, principally uh, within product gross margins as we continue to penetrate the disk market and, and scale our e-family. So hopefully that's helpful for you. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Next question, please. Our next question comes from Howard Ma from Guggenheim Partners. Your line is now open. Great. Uh, thank you for taking the question. I, my question is for Kevin. C Kevin, based on the customer data you have so far, on average, how much smaller does the, the TCB for an OPEX deal start compared to a CAPEX deal, and, and when is the crossover point? And just on a related note, I, I think it would be helpful for us if you could comment on, on the range of scenarios where, where an OPEX deal might start smaller or maybe much smaller than a, than a CAPEX deal, and, and, it, and, it, and it scenarios where an OPEX deal might start at the same size as a CAPEX deal. Thank you. Yeah, it's a great question, Howard, and, and I'll, I'll let uh, Charlie and, and Rob jump in too as they see fit. But when we think about, you know, obviously we have a lot of variation in, in terms of sizing. Uh, between our cap X offerings as well as evergreen one um, and and frankly, when we pull out the on demand billings and and then do a straight comparison on average deal size uh, we 're actually pretty close uh, when you when you take a step back between uh, value uh, at the order uh, level between capex and and uh, evergreen one but again, our data points are are principally uh, around fy twenty four uh, still a lot more time to see how that that evolves. 
Um, and Charlie, do you have any other points you'd want to raise? Yeah, you know, uh, Howard, it, it's a great question, and we're trying to uh, actually dig down into it ourselves in a number of different ways because rarely do we have a situation where it, the customer is deciding for the same environment, uh, exactly the same environment, one versus the other. And because of that, as Kevin mentioned, we have average numbers. Average numbers, uh, if you look across the entire uh, customer base and, and all the deals in the quarter, are coming out about the same, but it, that may not be true on an individual deal-by-deal -deal basis. Uh, my gut tells me that um, that the average TCV of a, uh, of a, uh, of a um, Evergreen One deal is, is somewhat lower than the capex, but that's a gut level reaction, not uh, not yet bolstered by by data. We're hoping to get a better handle of that over the next couple of quarters. What I will say, we do know though the break even. The break even uh, is approximately two and a half years. Yeah, that would be the uh, revenue break even. The rev sorry, the revenue break even for the same amount of capacity. And that what you're asking about is not necessarily same level of capacity, and we're still trying to figure that out. Thank you, Howard. Next question, please. Our next question comes from Pinjalim Bora from JP Morgan. Your line is now open. Oh, great. Uh, thanks for taking the questions and congrats on the quarter. Uh, just one question for Kevin. Kevin, I'm trying to understand uh, the guidance and kind of the assumption around your TCV bookings for Evergreen One. Um, last year, or fiscal 24, I thought four when you guided, we obviously, you had to raise the assumption on Evergreen One bookings con contribution through the year, and that led to a headwind to top line growth. What gives you confidence that 50% is kind of the right number and that at the end of the year or through half the year, it's not going to be 100%. I understand the numbers are a little bigger and you're assuming kind of the similar dollar additions, but um, I'm, I'm trying to understand just the risk to the top line guide. Thanks. Yeah, appreciate the question, Pendulum. And and look, you know, when we're we're coming up with, with our guide uh, for, you know, both the TCV sales of Evergreen One and Evergreen Flex, as well as our, our revenue guide, you have to imagine a lot of work in terms of modeling, uh, looking at pipeline, looking at opportunities are involved as part of that uh, process. And look, that then informs, uh, you know, our, our best view, if you will, of guide, which is 10.5% for revenue and the 50% growth rate that we gave for TCV sales uh, for Evergreen One and, and Evergreen Flex. And but you're really your question is, hey, what what if we see significant changes in mix and, and what's the impact and how do we think about that similar to the impact we saw in, in FY24? And look, if our if our sales mix, you know, result, results in less TCV sales growth of, of our subscription and consumption offerings, we would expect that our FY25 revenue growth would increase. That that would be our expectation as we sit here today. Now, on the reverse side, if, if TCV sales of Evergreen One and, and Flex grow significantly and, and well outperforms uh, our assumption of 50% growth, that would have an impact on our revenue growth rate. And as we progress uh, through the year, we'll continue to update sales performance across sales of Evergreen One and Flex uh, to give you that visibility. Thank you, Pendulum. Next question, please. Our next question comes from Krish Seinkar from TD Cohen. Your line is now open. Hey guys, this is Eddie for Krish. Uh, I'd like to ask about the eight-figure deal with major GPU cloud provider you guys talked about. Can you talk about where pure systems are being used for in there? In there? Like, are, are your systems directly feeding the GPUs for training or inference, or are they, are they being used in backup and archive, for example? Also wondering uh, if you can discuss the flash blade versus flash array mix in there and whether there is some E-series. I think investors would like to understand where your systems sit within these AI workloads so they can better understand the opportunity there. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, Eddie, this is Rob. Thanks for the question. Uh, I'll take that one. Uh, so Charlie mentioned, uh, you know, uh, very excited about this win. Uh, you know, the customer here is one of the largest uh, GPU cloud providers. Uh, what's interesting and, and kind of exciting about the uh, usage and use cases in this environment is it, it's really a mix uh, of a number of use cases, uh, all involved in the AI uh, training uh, workflow. Uh, so a portion of it uh, is being used uh, for data preparation, uh, pre and post processing. Uh, a large portion uh, is being used for direct uh, AI training that is uh, a 
as you said, uh, directly feeding training data into and out of uh, uh, GPU servers. Uh, a lot of model experimentation uh, is, is being done on these environments. Uh, as well, uh, this environment is uh, supporting a large uh, number of users uh, doing, you know, kind of going through these workflows uh, and, and doing this development uh, and performing these tasks. I think the second part of your question was uh, to better understand the product mix uh, as part of this sale. Uh, I will remind you, it, this was a large Evergreen One deal, uh, you know, which is, uh, um, you know, I think uh, it speaks to uh, the dynamic nature uh, of a lot of the work in, in uh, this space. Uh, as, you know, a lot of the uh, AI workflows, uh, you know, expand beyond just uh, high-speed training into the broader set of data preparation, all the elements that I just walked you through, uh, Evergreen One uh, creates a lot of flexibility in that model uh, for the service provider, the cloud provider in this case, uh, to deploy the right service levels uh, for the right usages. Uh, that said, um, you know, currently uh, the entirety of the environment is being served uh, with the FlashBlade uh, product set. Uh, so hopefully that gives you a, a little bit more uh, color to think about, uh, you know, our opportunity and, and really the points of validation in this space. Thank you, Eddie. Next question, please. Our next question comes from Jason Adder from William Blair. Your line is now open. Yeah, hi, guys. Um, just wanted to ask if, if and when you might be willing to give us revenues from Evergreen One and Flex. Uh, Jason, great question. Um, let, let, let us work through the uh, transparency we're giving you on, on TCV sales for the time being and the conversion uh, of, of those TCV sales in terms of normalized revenue, and you'll see that in the, in the slides we presented. I think that uh, is a level of, of bridging we'll want to do at this point in time in terms of where we're sitting. Thank you, Jason. Next question, please. Our next question comes from David Vogt from UBS. Your line is now open. Great. Thanks, guys, for taking my question. And, and Kevin, I'm going to come back to that prior question. If I, I'm just trying to think through all of the different disclosures that you gave for 24 and 25 and trying to normalize for, you know, the traditional model historically, you know, product and or services. I mean, just by, based on my math, it looks like your revenue over the last couple of years would have compounded at roughly 9%. Is that a reasonable framework when I make all the adjustments for um, the, model, the model transition and the telco customer push out from 24 and 25? And if that's the case, what's the core underlying sort of storage demand that you think underpins that over the last couple of years? And, and how did your share look during those periods? Thanks. Charlie, do you want to hit storage demand and market share first, and then I'll, I'll hit the modeling question? Yeah, I, I think the, the core, um, David, of, of your question, you know, really relates to, you, you know, are, are we picking up market share and at, at what rate? Uh, you know, we feel pretty confident that we're in the still uh, we remain in the 10 to 15 percent market share pickup rate uh, for a variety which is not necessarily reported uh, by the reporting agencies mainly because they do not uh, in, incorporate our uh, evergreen forever uh, 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 subscription which as you know means that we don't resell the same storage you know when when an array becomes obsolete because in our case arrays don't become obsolete. So with that, um, I, I can't, you know, we're, I think the team is taking a good look at the, uh, we know what it would have been, and Kevin stated it in his uh, preamble, that it would have been around seven, a little over 7% this year. I don't have the numbers for the, the prior year. Do you have that, Kevin? No. We'll have to, we'll have to get back to you on that. But your, your basic premise that, you know, we're, uh, that the, the market is undercounting what we believe is, would be our growth uh, if our Evergreen One sales were actually in uh, standard product sales is absolutely correct. The, the other thing too, um, David, is you can kind of do back of the envelope um, calculation to, to estimate the amount of revenue uh, that's coming off uh, Evergreen One and Evergreen Flex. Uh, given that, you know, our average duration uh, of these contracts is around three years, and, and obviously we've given you the uh, TCV sales for uh, FY24, uh, growing in excess of 100%, uh, as well as our expectations for TCV sales for Evergreen One and Evergreen Flex for FY25. Thank you, David. Great. Next question, Great, thanks, please. Next question comes from Tom Blakey from KeyBank Capital Markets. Your line is now open. Hey, guys. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Um, 
I think it's a little bit on the same line of questioning here from David and Pendulum. The, maybe you could discuss a different way. Um, you talked about an improving storage demand environment uh, across the, across your products, um, Charlie. And could you just maybe talk about you know the forever and straight up product sales, kind of like exit rates in fiscal four Q and what you're kind of seeing in fiscal one Q, to maybe even uh, and, and get some insight into the level of possible conservatism in your guide there on the product side. Thank you. You know, as we indicated, I think at the end of our in our Q3 call and now in Q4, we're, we are seeing uh, strong indications of uh, of improving demand. You know, both I think in in, uh, in the actual results as well as in in uh, pipeline as we go forward and in our conversations with customers overall. So that's what's what's giving us confidence. I think uh, you know, Kevin, in terms of. Uh, uh, of yeah, you know, we generally don't provide uh, direct exit rates, uh, but uh... yeah, we, we don't. But I think we we've talked about it directionally, and, and obviously the the strength we're seeing, uh, you know, both in FY24 and, and FY25 is is really being driven from a growth perspective by our subscription services and subscription services revenue. And and when we think about it directionally uh, next year, but to Charlie's point, he's right. We don't guide specifically on, on product revenue and subscription revenue. I think it's a good way to think about uh, product revenue being flattish to maybe slightly down and really that growth uh, being driven by our subscription services uh, overall for FY25. Perfect. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Charlie. Next question, please. Our next question comes from Simon Simon Leopold from Raymond James. Your line is now open. Thanks for taking the question. Uh, earlier in the uh, Q and A, uh, Charlie broke down the the AI opportunities into sort of the three buckets, and and I found that helpful. And what I really wanted to see if we could unpack a bit is the the item described as data uplift. In, in other words, I'm trying to get a better sense of what you're assuming for really the timing of when that becomes material and how you expect it to manifest itself in terms of is it sales to enterprises as opposed to needing to break into hyperscalers or, or the, you know, the operators of the AI platform. Just a little bit yeah. more unpacking if that would help. Thank you. Oh, absolutely, Simon. So your, I, I think your instinct on this is, is absolutely correct. What the, the concept is that, of course, uh, regardless of, of uh, the manner in which enterprises want to build, whether they want to build their own data um, uh, environment for AI or do their own modeling or do their own inference or not, they do have to make their data available uh, for, uh, for analysis by the, uh, by the AI engine. In order to do that, their data today is, is largely trapped, I say trapped in silos. It's on storage uh, environments that were largely purchased, uh, very much uh, storage is bought with economics in mind, and they are purchased uh, at the performance level and at the capacity level necessary for their primary job, which generally means there's not a lot of, of performance left over uh, to be able to serve up data uh, for, um, for analytics of any type, let alone AI. And even if, even if they had that performance, they're, they're not networked. Uh, traditional um, storage arrays, are not networked at the array level. You have to go through the application environment, uh, which is not terribly useful and very indirect. That would mean that customers would generally have to copy that data and buy new arrays anyway. And in our case, what, we're, we're, what our platform allows them to do is uh, replace those arrays for their, for their primary purpose, going from disk to flash, and have plenty of, uh, of performance left over for the AI environment. So they get to modernize their environment, reduce their power space and cooling by a factor of 10, uh, uh, have much higher reliability, uh, lower labor associated with it, and at the same time now uh, update their, their data environment so that, it, so that it is available for AI analysis. And just to, just to build on that a little bit, um, you know, Charlie mentioned a lot of these uh, silos and fragmented pools of data storage uh, really aren't networked today. Uh, let me take it from a, a customer and a procurement lens. If you look at a lot of these environments, data storage has historically been uh, purchased and, and configured application by application, department by department, uh, completely independently. And in a world where that data store was really only being used for a single purpose, that, you know, that worked okay. 
but the whole power of AI technology is being able to connect all these data sets and glean from them uh, in, in unison uh, greater insights. In order to do that, you've got to actually connect all of these things. And so when we step back from it and we think about you know, our position uh, with our platform strategy, being able to uh, pull all these pools of data together, uh, that's what we really see as the larger uh, opportunity set here. And then when you think about timing, what, what I'm seeing is it's the, most, it's the companies that are the most advanced in their thinking and analysis of what they might do with AI that are just beginning to realize, oh my gosh, you know, regardless of you know, how many GPUs we buy or lease or rent, our data, is, our, our data governance is, is very poor. Our ability to get uh, access to that data is very poor. So I, I think um, I think it's going to take time for the general market uh, to you know come to full grips with this. So I see it more late this year, early early next year. In the meantime, you know we have uh, there's plenty of economic reasons why customers would want to use our e-family to replace disk uh, when that's coming up anyway. So uh, you know as I see it, the e-family kills two birds with one stone. It's a better replacement and it uh, prepares them for AI. Thank you, Simon. Next question, please. Our next question comes from Neil Chokshi from Northland Capital Markets. Your line is now open. Yeah, thank you. And uh, nice uh, results. And thank you for that uh, detail on what the Evergreen One bookings does to your overall revenue. That's great. Uh, I want to double click on the major win with the uh, with the win on the major GPU uh, cloud provider. Specifically, I'd like to understand how penetrated are you within that opportunity, as well as if you're not, if that deal does not put you at 100% penetration, then what is being utilized alternatively uh, in this in, at that particular uh, GPU provider? Uh, yeah, Nahal, I'll, I'll take that one. This is Rob. Um, you know, we're we're it's not 100 percent. So I'll tell you that. Um, look, we're you know we're very pleased with the win. I think uh, you know as I mentioned before. Um, you know, what, what's particularly exciting is the uh, mix of use cases uh, uh, being uh, um, uh, deployed uh, on our uh, footprint there. Um, and look, I, I think, it, uh, as we mentioned, it's one of the largest GPU cloud uh, providers out there. Our focus at this point uh, really is in ramping uh, that Evergreen One consumption, uh, uh, driving uh, those initial project deployments uh, to success, and, and we'll see where that takes us. Thank you, Nate. Uh, next. Yeah, I, was, I was just wondering, can, can Rob... Uh, describe what is alternatively being utilized then before pure source came in? Uh, you know, I, I really can't speak to that. I don't, I don't know that we have the visibility into that. Got it. Thank, Thank you, you. Nahal. Next question, please. Our next question comes from Eric Martinuzzi from Lake Street. Your line is now open. Yeah, I saw you had a, a small workforce realignment charge in Q4. I was curious to know what the, the goal of the realignment was, and are we done with that? Yeah, uh, you know, we uh, have uh, you know got, uh, uh, restructured to some extent inside the organization to focus much more on, um, on customer segments, enterprise, uh, commercial, and, um, and hyperscaler. Uh, and putting you know specialized teams focused on driving business process to fit those three models uh, you know in a in a very coordinated way across uh, across the company and based on that you know we've moved people and moved uh, uh, roles uh, to different areas and that also meant that uh, you know there were some roles that were being eliminated and that's what really caused the uh, the restructuring. And no, we don't, I mean, it, that was, uh, you know, limited really to the reorganization that we put in place. Thank you, Eric. Uh, I think this next question is a person who got back in line. Um, so I think this will be the last question. Next question is Aaron Rakers from Wells Fargo. Your line is now open. All right, thanks for taking the follow-up. Um, just because it has not been asked, I, I, I'm curious, Given the AI, you know, discussion and the narrative around the, the pure story, um, just where we're at, you know, with regard to Meta and, and that deployment, AI RSC. I know there's been a lot of discussion about the expansion of, of Meta's GPU footprint. I'm just curious of wh where you currently see yourself at, and, and whether or not, you know, there's any assumptions of, you know, opportunity at Meta baked into your guide this year. 
Yeah, thanks, Aaron. This is Rob. Uh, welcome back for round two. Um, uh, our relationship with Meta is stronger than ever. Uh, you know, we're working with them, uh, you know, uh, uh, on almost a continuous basis. And uh, as we said before, they continue to realize uh, incredible value uh, from our solutions in place. Um, I think specific to your question, uh, just asking about, you know, did we see uh, additional sales to the RSC environment? Uh, you know, we, uh, as we've said before, uh, you know, we have sales to Meta in almost every quarter, including in other AI environments. Uh, we didn't have sales into RSC, but uh, as we've mentioned, uh, you know, we typically wouldn't be uh, uh, updating or commenting on sales uh, into other environments, uh, including other uh, AI deployments there. Thank you very Thank much, you. Aaron. Uh, Charlie, before you give concluding remarks, maybe you could um, comment on Mita's second really excellent question about whether we're at a different crossover point now to the All Flash data center. Yeah, Mita, uh, um, I think that, that it's a great question. I, I still believe we're early in that process. I, I started uh, saying last year that I expected the last uh, 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 disk storage array to be sold in about uh, five years' time. We're now on four, we're now four years in front of that. I'm going to stick with that with that timetable. Uh, I think customers uh, the the growth of our e family has been really tremendous this year, but it's early still early days. We're expecting even greater growth, obviously uh, this year ahead. Uh, but uh, you know, considering how much disk is out there, it will take a bit of time. Um, I I am very bullish on this, and I'll stick with it that. Uh, that I think uh, the next three to four years, uh, we're going to see the decline of, of disk systems. And then you had some concluding right. statement. Well, I, I do want to thank everyone for joining us today, as always, on, on today's earnings call. You know, the platform strategy that we've built is now leading the data, stories, uh, data storage industry's transformation. Uh, we are seeing just incredible response uh, to uh, really unifying the way that data operates within the enterprise environment. With this unified and modern storage platform, enterprises now can really uniquely tackle their fragmented data environments. And that's what's going to allow them in part to unleash the full potential of their artificial intelligence. I do wanna thank our customers, our employees, our partners, uh, investors and suppliers. And your dedication, your collaboration, your trust are the really the driving forces behind our progress. Uh, thank you all for your support and your commitment. That concludes the Pure Storage Fiscal Fourth Quarter and Full Year 2024 Earnings Call. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect your line.